I'm Paul McKinney. I'm going to talk a little bit about some low-level concurrency. Um, but first, uh, since this is kernel recipes, I have a recipe for concurrent programming. Uh, you need a little bit of the laws of physics. You need to know a little bit more about the hardware you're running on. Um, you need, unfortunately, this is the hard part, you need to really well understand your requirements. Okay? Uh, it's necessary to very carefully design what you're doing, including synchronization primitives. And thank you to VGuard for producing this nice list. I mean, you can't get everything out of the sheet. I mean, it's only two sheets of AVAR paper, for crying out loud. But um, you've got all the primitives, and you can go find them and find the documentation. This is great. And I'll be using this later in the talk as well. Uh, the other thing, this is the most important, brutal validation. Validation beyond anything you think is even reasonable at all. Okay? And if you make it, validate beyond anything you think is reasonable at all, you might get half of the errors. All right? So brutal validation. But this talk is going to focus on the first two. Some laws of physics and a bit of low-level information, but not really detailed information about the hardware. Okay, now, if you're around in the 90s um, for the marketing hype about uh, CPU core clock frequencies, um, you might have gotten an impression like this if you were sufficiently young and naive, which I was in the 80s. Um, and, you know, it's a benchmark track meet, and the fastest CPU wins, and life is great, and uh, not anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it's more of an obstacle course these days than track. And Willie alluded to some of the obstacles. I mean, I gave him a hard time about linked lists, but the fact is, if you're doing too many pointer dereferences, it's hard for the CPUs to run at full speed. Not impossible, but hard. All right. Well, this is one of these things. You've got a guy my age, and sooner or later, you know they don't make them like they used to. <laughs> Just don't make them like they used to. Um, I actually used a microprocessor like the guy on the left there, um, although without the beard, eyes, arms, and legs. Uh, a 68,000 pre-production prototype in 1981. It looked a lot like that. Um, and uh, there was no cash on board. I don't even think there was a store buffer. I put it on a breadboard and hooked it up to a Z80, a 64-bit, a 64-kilobyte memory, 8-bit processor. And you could, with a parallel port, you could kind of talk to its bus. Um, and one thing that goes with the beard, this thing was patient. I went to bed one night, got up the next morning and realized I'd left it waiting for memory. You know, it done its, uh, presented the address and was waiting for the data transfer acknowledged just patiently. So I fitted the data and happily took it and went from there. Um, so uh, patience is not a uh, attribute of current microprocessors for the most part. On the other hand, uh, the users need less patience than they do back then. So um, uh, no cache, shallow pipeline, inner execution, so on. Predictable, very slow execution. I think that thing was like two megahertz, maybe four, all right? Mega, that was megahertz, not gigahertz. Uh, this thing is, runs at about two gigahertz, so roughly three orders of magnitude faster. And it's got all the, all the stuff there, large cache, deep pipeline, out of order, uh, superscalar, and unpredictable, but very fast execution if you set your code up correctly and have a good workload. So we can think of the old 68,000 pre-production as kind of this tiny bulldozer, all right? It's, it's not very powerful by today's standards, but it just goes at its pace no matter what's in the way. Just, you know, plies, plows right through. Uh, today's process, like in this laptop, is more like a semi-tractor trailer. Very fast, very high capacity, but you've got to have a paved road for the thing, right? The bulldozer doesn't really care. It'll go through a tree, through a house, you know, whatever. It, it doesn't need to go around it like the semi would. In fact, the semi not only has to go around the house, there has to be a road for it to go around the house. And we could argue about what a freight train would be, but uh, if you want to later on. Uh, the first concurrent system I used had an 8386, and this is a block diagram of an 8386. And there's not that many boxes there. It's, uh, you know, fairly simple. Uh, it's got an instruction queue, um, you know, a little, bit of, a little bit of queuing, but not much. And uh, this is, I've got the CPU board still. And so these guys right here, the Intel 386s, second from the bottom, those are the CPUs. This is a dual CPU board. And uh, the cool thing about this, the cool thing about this, this thing taught me concurrency, that and a logic analyzer. You could take those chips off. You, know, you could take one of them off. You could put a logic analyzer probe on it, put the chip back on. You had to leave a space in the bus so that the probe had space to come out. So you had to leave one of your bus slots empty. But you pull it out there, and you could see what that thing was doing. You know, instruction by instruction, instruction fetch, pull this data up, you know, write this other thing out. 
you know, you did this fetch and it took this long, it's just, you know, right out there. It's just really trivially discoverable. Uh, although I suppose these days we have perf for that, but uh, uh, I was viciously disappointed when I tried this with a 4D6. You could do the same setup, but it has so much on-chip cache, you couldn't tell what the heck it was doing. All right, um, uh, but instructions took several cycles. The fastest instruction was something like three cycles back then, and this was 25 megahertz. So, um, you know, uh, something like 125 nanoseconds to do one instruction, best case. And what we did later is we had pipeline execution. This is actually a really old, old slide. Uh, and here we've got something that's obviously hyper-threaded. We've got two things going in concurrently. And we've got five-stage pipeline here, and uh, we're just doing 10 instructions at once, okay, in the, in the best case. And they're getting retired two at a time. So we're getting a throughput of two instructions per clock. And each instruction could take up to five clocks, which is actually more clocks than the 8386 was taking. But we make up for it, in most cases, by retiring more instructions, or we potentially can. So pipelines, wonderful things and all that. Um, and this is, this is not a new machine. This is an Intel Core 2, which is quite a ways back. Okay, so why did I put such an old machine on the slide? And, and the reason is because you, I can put it there and, you can, and the boxes are kind of visible and you might have a chance if you're in the front row of reading the boxes uh, in contrast to the more recent uh, things. But, you know, this is, <laughs> there's all sorts of stuff going on here. You know, you go ahead and count how many functional units there are in the middle there. There's a large number, more than 10, uh, and a lot going on. So do we really have to understand all that stuff to write concurrent code? And why, right? So this is a uh, cross-section of a, uh, a research thing. There's a layer of molybdenum di disulfide and some chrome dioxide and also a carbon nanotube. Each of those spots, you know, like that and that and that, those are atoms. Okay, this is a scanning, tunneling, electron microscope of this thing. And you know, if you'd have told me this when I was a kid, I was kind of into science as a kid. If you told me, you know, Paul, when you grow up, you'll be in Paris and you'll tell people that atoms are too big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what I would have said, but I sure would not have believed you, okay? I guarantee you that. But here we are, right? The problem we have is with transistors. Transistors have a source, a base, and a drain. And the speed the transistor goes is controlled by the electrical thickness of the base. And uh, you kind of have to make these things at least one atom thick. Which, and 15 years ago, I saw scanning electron microscopes of with like this many, four atoms across the base. I'm pretty sure they've got single ones in production by now. And that kind of limits how fast they can make things go. So atoms really are too big. The other problem is that the speed of light is too slow. Now, if you told me that as a kid, <laughs> I'd have believed you. Because in, this was, I was, I was uh, going to school in the 60s and 70s. You know, the space program was really going. And all of us boys were going to be astronauts. Every one of us was going to be an astronaut, right? And it was, I was very painfully aware that the speed of light was really slow for things like interstellar travel, which I thought was really a horrible problem. But if you told me it was going to be a problem for computing, what? <laughs> but here we are again. Um, so uh, again, I'm going to get this prop out again. Thank you, Vigard. Uh, I, I actually have a one-foot ruler, but I forgot it and left it home. And uh, well, uh, I'm sure there's a one-foot ruler somewhere in Paris that I could buy, but I wasn't able to find one quickly. Uh, and of course, this is Admiral Grace Topper's uh, light traveling one foot in one nanosecond, which happens to be about that distance, all right? So uh, if you don't like one foot max for one foot per nanosecond, one length of A4 paper per nanosecond. All right, so um, light goes that far in a vacuum. Problem is, though, when we're doing computation, we're not just sending the data. You know, we're not just, we're saying, hey, give me some data, and then it comes back which means you have to go both directions, and so suddenly you're down to six inches, or half of an A4 sheet, as you prefer. Now, my father actually took an EE degree in the 50s, and they studied vacuum tubes, all right? Uh, so potentially, you could do something with speed of light in a vacuum, and some of the computers use vacuum tubes, but uh, trust me, those computers are way slower than what we're using today. 
And so we don't have vacuum tubes. We have copper. Uh, there's some, uh, re well, by my standards, recent innovation, you can actually put copper on silicon chips. And uh, an electric wave in copper is about a third the speed of light. All right? Inside silicon, the transistors, the active component especially, you get to divide by 10 again. And at that point, we're at about a tenth of an inch, or if you prefer, 2.5 millimeters. And that's way slower, way smaller than most computer chips. Yeah, you can get some microcontrollers that are, that are that, but they tend to be single CPU, so who cares, right? And so we have a problem. You go over that far and back in a clock cycle, and you got things this big if just for the chip, and things that are this, you know, uh, this big for if you're a data center and you have a system, and this big if you are less concerned about density. Okay, and, and that's, we're not done yet, unfortunately. Uh, speed of light's bad enough, size of that is bad enough, but you know, uh, you go through a bunch of stuff. And we've already talked about copper and silicon and electric waves being too slow. We've also got mathematics. You have a cash clearance protocol. There are transactions involved. States, state changes, and that slows you down. Electronics hits you twice. Uh, multiplexing and demultiplexing, because you have a bunch of CPUs, on, a bunch of cores, I should say, on this internal on the chip bus, and that costs you. Uh, in the old days, I haven't, didn't get a chance to check into it. In the old days, if you went from one clock domain to another, so you have a CPU clock frequency, and you have a slower memory clock frequency, or off-chip and on-chip, however you want to look at it. Uh, in the old days, that was three times the period of the slow clock to safely cross that boundary. All right? So um, electronics is hitting you again, and, and it, actually there's an exception. If the clocks are an integral multiple of each other, then you can do it much more quickly, except that with you know, voltage and frequency scaling, forget it, that doesn't happen, right? Maybe it was for an instant or two, but then they decide they want the CPU to run a different speed, and too bad. Um, and out on the memory end, if you have certain kinds of SSDs, you might even have some chemistry doing phase changes for you. So we've got a bunch of things that are slowing us down. All right, so there's a summary of it. The thing is, that we, we're impatient. You know, unlike that CPU that waited all night for, for the little 8-bit micro to hand it its memory that it asked for, we're pretty impatient and we want our stuff to go fast. And so all of this unfortunately matters, or maybe fortunately, depending on what you're looking at. I, I once had the privilege of uh, attending a lecture by Gordon Moore, you know, the Gordon Moore that did Moore's Law. And he told of an incident where they invited none other than Stephen Hawking to Intel Research and uh, took a look at what they were doing. They wanted to see if there was something that basic physics could do for them. So uh, uh, Hawking reportedly listened intently to this whole thing, and at the end he said, Gentlemen, you have two fundamental problems. First, the finite state of speed of light, and second, the atomic nature of matter. So, so it's not just me saying this stuff, okay? <laughs> it's not just me, I'm sorry. On the other hand, uh, if one of you guys figures a way around this, uh, there, there might be a Nobel Prize waiting for you, okay? So, <laughs> you don't give up, but uh, it may take some proving. So why do we do all this? Okay, well, you know, uh, we've got slow light, fat, big fat atoms. Uh, so coming back to the question, we had that block diagram of uh, Intel Core 2, which is an old CPU and therefore probably a simpler one. Uh, do you have to know all that stuff? And, and sometimes you do, all right? Uh, Brendan Gregg was talking about using perf and finding out exactly where things were slowing up, branch prediction problems and things like that. And if you want to get the last little drop of performance out of your computer system, yeah, you got to know all that stuff. Uh, but we kind of like portability because CPUs change from family to family with each revision of silicon a little bit. Uh, we have hardware bugs and, uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, covert channels. And uh, all of that has an effect. And also, even as a given CPU ages, it changes. Some of them, anyway. So one of the things that can happen with some CPUs, I don't know if the Core 2 does this, but it may go along and realize that it's having a problem. And so it may just deconfigure the offending component. And then suddenly, if you've just micro-optimized your software to the particular CPU, suddenly you're not optimized anymore. And suddenly you're running really slowly because that ALU isn't there anymore. So there's some disadvantages. I mean, if you need to super optimize, do so. 
but understand that you're doing so with a particular CPU at a point in its lifespan. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a, a simpler, more portable CPU model. Kind of cartoon-like, really. We're going to look at the CPU, just say, hey, that's a CPU. We don't really care what's inside of it. We're going to say, hey, there's a store buffer, and then there's some cache. And we have an interconnect, but we're just going to really abstract that stuff away. Now, I, I, I've often been heard to say that uh, premature abstraction is the root of all evil in current computing. Um, so in my defense, I didn't do this abstraction until I've been working with currency for a couple decades. So, you know, it's okay. Maybe. Maybe. All right. Uh, the other thing we have is that there are systems with a lot of CPUs. Uh, this is one I had the privilege of using a couple of years ago, unfortunately, like all things that its life eventually ended, but it was a lot of fun while it lasted. This thing had 448 hardware threads spread across eight sockets, and the sockets are grouped uh, four per board. So it looked kind of like that. All right. So um, we t I mentioned before that uh, the 80s and 90s marketing hype had the CPU track meet where all you cared about was clock frequency. And I said it was more of an obstacle course, so all right, what are the obstacles, right? Well, uh, we heard from Brendan about, uh, he, he put a little thing up there about uh, branch delays, and, uh, and that's one of the things that happened. You, we got that nice pipeline you want to keep full, all right? Well, there's a lot of branches, and so you hit the hardware predicts the branches and guesses, and if it guesses wrong, there's a bunch of work that's done in the pipeline that it suddenly has to say, oh, drop that on the floor or wait for stuff to catch up, and that's a stall, all right? And it, it was important enough that uh, Brendan had it in his little dashboard for doing uh, checking out optimization. So if you want to run at full speed, you need perfect branch prediction. Uh, the 0.1% he was showing is pretty impressive, actually, but it's not zero. Okay. Uh, memory reference. Uh, sooner or later, uh, uh, Willie mentioned the L3 cache, and that's bad enough, but eventually you have to actually go out to DRAM. And... Uh, uh, that's expensive. It can be hundreds of clock cycles. Uh, and uh, if you haven't got something overlapping or some way of making that up, uh, you go slowly. Atomic operations are not as bad as they used to be. Um, on a certain uh, microprocessor in, introduced around 2003 or so, um, it was like 75 nanoseconds overhead to do an atomic. Uh, well, the CPU designers weren't happy when I told them that was bad. Uh, these days, it's a lot less, but still, um, you have to actually make sure you get the cache line in the right mode. Uh, you have to make sure that you have things ordered across it because it's supposed to be atomic and uh, it's higher overhead. Memory barriers, well, we need them to keep things ordered, but their whole purpose is to make sure stuff doesn't happen out of order, and that means you're telling the CPU to do something later than it would have otherwise. Uh, and so that you end up with a performance impact there as well. Of course, if you don't have them, then you're Stuff doesn't work, but, you know, details. Uh, one thing that uh, experience I had was I very carefully made something very scalable, and I ran on my laptop and it wasn't scaling. Uh, and I eventually figured out that as I got up beyond a certain number of CPUs, the fan turned on, right? Uh, so you can end up optimizing very carefully and finding that uh, it hits thermal throttling and slows the CPUs down and just makes your efforts useless. Of course, if you're a gamer, you have so much cooling that this never happens. Uh, but uh, not all of us are willing to splash out as much money on a system as a typical gamer is, or the high-end gamers, anyway. Cache misses. We talk, Willie talked about that. Uh, Brendan talked about that. Uh, it's going to take a while. Uh, there's another obstacle on the road. And if you think cache misses are bad, try I.O. Well, SSDs are a lot better than rotating rust. But still, as we've heard, uh, they send things in large blocks, and it takes a while. So here's the obstacles we have. Um, and what I'm trying to do is, I'm in, with this presentation, I'm not trying to make the world perfect. I'm just trying to help you with design. So my hope is that if people take this to heart, we can help Brendan make his five-day goal by making his days four and five a little less intensive or less reasons why day four and five would show up. <laughs> glad to help. I'm not sure if she's spelled with one L or two L's, but I'm glad to help. <laughs> okay, so we're going to focus on these two because these can be overcome often in a portable manner. 
I mean, sometimes you can get the cash geometry to work out right. Sometimes you need other things. But these guys we can focus on and do something reasonable with. And if we do these guys really well, we might have less need to do the really hard, weird stuff. Fun though the hard, weird stuff has been from time to time for me in the past. OK. Um, so this is actually not that different than what uh, Willie showed. I'm not going to go through it in great detail. I'll, I'll explain. Uh, so uh, lock, you just acquire and release the lock. A, a blind cast is where you don't do a load ahead of time. So if it is equal to the constant 0, make it be 1. That would be blind. A not blind cast, just cast up there, is where we pick the thing up and do something to it, maybe we or something with it, and then we do a compare and swap. So we've done a load, a little bit of arithmetic, and then a compare and swap. And as you can see, there's quite a difference in cost. Let's just look at the bottom, where we're, where we're the worst case, where we're going all the way from CPU 0 to CPU 447, all right? And uh, so we're going across a socket boundary through some inter interconnects, across a board boundary, another set of socket boundaries, and eventually to the other CPU, and back. And so if we just do the compare and swap without having to do the load first, we're looking at about 700 clocks. And if we have to actually look at the thing and then do something and store it, well, let's, say you're, let's say that you uh, were too silly to use atomic ink, and instead you emulate it with compare exchange, so you pick it up, increment it, and do a compare and swap to store it. Uh, that's you know, almost 2,000 2, cycles there. It's a lot of cycles. Uh, of course, different hardware is going to act differently. Well, the same har hardware on a uh, different time of the day will act differently, depending on what's going on with thermals and, and its age and so on. But this is a rough idea of what we're up against. Um, all right, so location matters, not just in real estate, it also matters in computing. Um, and the colors here, the red guy, CPU 0 up at the very top, which you might or not, might not be able to see, uh, if he's communicating with himself, life is wonderful. It's all his caches work for him. His uh, uh, CPU 224 in this case, which is his, the other hyperthread in the same core, uh, I didn't make that numbering up, I'm sorry, you know, uh, go yell at somebody else. Um, then it's still, it's in the same core, it's still very fast. If you have to go to another core in the socket, a little bit slower. Uh, the other three sockets are slower yet. If you have to go across all the way to the other board, uh, then things are extremely slow. So locality is a big deal here. Okay, so um, the thing is I put some numbers up there. Matthew put some numbers up there. They're not that far different, okay? Uh, but numbers, right? They're just numbers. So let's, uh, let's get some reality behind this. And uh, uh, unlike in the U.S., the uh, manufacturers of this, these things aren't really all that proud to see how many sheets they're on. But with this size, I think it's about 300. All right. So what we're going to do here is we'll start with you. You grab, we'll unroll it. Okay. And I'm going to keep one of these things if I can make it come off. This is one clock cycle. All right. One clock cycle. Remember that. <laughs> I'll put it right here for right now. Maybe it'll still be there. And uh, you could start the next one. And. Uh, uh, if, if these are, and I'll start in the middle on both sides here. Uh, there you are, sir. You get one. Uh, and, and don't break the chain. That's bad luck. All right. <laughs> and we'll go on the back here. That's All right. All right. Now, uh, just go and roll them and just hand them off to the people next to you. So start rolling, you know, and, uh, and uh, give the roll to the next person. And, and uh, if you're in the front four, go backwards. Uh, otherwise, obviously, go forwards. Yeah, that's right. Just keep on rolling. Very good. Very good. You got it there. Yeah, that's how kind of it started. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, yeah, just keep going. Keep going. Uh, go backwards. So you hand hand to the guy behind you, please. Very good. Uh, we gave you a tough one there. Oh no! Tie it back together, quick, before it breaks again. This is. Uh... Oh, okay. I see what's going on here. There we are. There you go. Okay. Yeah, hand, hand up, that's it. Very good. And uh, yeah, keep going back and forth. You know, keep going back and forth. All right. Yeah, there we are. Oh, look at that. Okay, these guys are doing it the uh, the uh, pipeline manner here. That's that's impressive. <laughs> Teddy of four. Teddy of four. Yeah, you, this guy knew. This guy knows. <laughs> Teddy of four was in fact the uh, CPU family that I that I uh, said 75 nanoseconds was bad for atomic operations. And, and 
Uh, no, in fact, the people who were responsible got really, really, really annoyed at me for telling them. <laughs> they were not happy with me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, look at that. How are we doing in the back there? Are we getting those guys uh, stuck to you? Okay, very good. How are we doing on this side in the back? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, what we've got here, once we get these all spooled out, is, uh, uh, and uh, hey, look, it's still here. That isn't always the case with this sort of thing. Um, so that's one clock cycle. And we've got spread out here, or almost spread out here, is about 1800 clock cycles. So not quite a non-blind cache miss across the electrical diameter of that machine I showed you. All right? So, you know, take a look and see what you got. It's uh, big. Yeah. Good idea, Willie. Hold it up. Yeah, that's it. Be proud. Hold on. Yeah, there we are. Very good. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, that's an innovation. I haven't done that in one of these before. Thank you, Willie. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, we've got some serious latency. Well, okay, uh, we're softer guys. Well, can hardware help us? Come on, hardware, you know, can't you do something better than this? And, well, sort of. This is the one I think is the most cool. And I mean that in several possible meanings of the word cool, by the way, okay? Um, what you can do is you can build your transistor instead of having uh, a thing and then a layer and another, another layer, you can actually kind of have point together like that, and those balls are like individual atoms. So you bring it to an atomic tip, and then the thing is, you can make a vacuum tube, all right? Um, and you don't have to have a full atomic diameter between them because you can get closer, right? Because you don't have to have an atom in there. And the cool thing about this, um, with normal vacuum tubes, is a pain. You have to have this uh, sealed thing. You have to have cesium inside it to suck up all the extra stuff that leaks in. With this thing, for all intents and purposes, at these nanoscales, the atmosphere is a vacuum. So you can just run it like that, and it's great. Um, they actually made some of these in a research lab. And as near as I, if I remember correctly, what they did was they took a chip and made like a few million of them, and then found the three or four that worked. <laughs> Which, it, it was a really, that, I mean, that's a really impressive technical depth demonstration, however you look at it. But this isn't something that we're going to, you know, scale up to billion transistor chips, let alone trillion transistor chips. That's, you know, it's still a research toy. Now, there is another alternative. I personally have moved carbon, di carbon monoxide molecule across several planes of copper. And I even got the badge for it. Uh, the picture on the badge was done in the uh, late 80s. Now, those are xenon atoms, and they spelled IBM on a, a, an insanely flat sheet of, I think, copper again. Uh, but those have to be at uh, liquid helium temperatures to make this work. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I mean, our, our, I like the artisanal stuff, you know, handmade, that's kind of good. But, you know, for transistors, billions on a chip, this isn't going to be how we do it. And maybe somebody will come up with some way to making these at scale, but it hasn't happened yet. So, uh, we, absent a breakthrough like that, we still have incremental help. One thing is that wafers and chips are really flat. And so if you whack it in quarters and then stack them up, you have the distance, pretty much. I mean, you've got a little bit of space up, but it's, it's insignificant compared to the other part. And uh, people really do this. I mean, that's a, that's a GPU chip from a while back, or a package or something. As you can see, they've stacked, they, they've got it stacked to the sky. Lots of, lots of different pieces piled up there. So they've gone a long ways in this direction. Um, now, they're starting to do this lithographically. This is a demonstration again, and there's a lot of things that might, uh, you know, there's, a, there's some distance between this and actual production, but they might make it, where you actually make transistors on top of each other with lithography, as opposed to having to make them a single layer and then cut them and stack them. And uh, this might do even better. Right now, there's a weird restriction where you have to pair the transistors. You have an NMOS there, it has to be QMOS below, which might or might not be something the CPU designers like. But that's their problem. So the thing is that uh, hardware guys are helping us with this, and they have been for some years. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, I'm not noticing it. Well, let's take a look at the off-core CAS 
for, uh, that's within a socket, but off core, all right? And that's uh, about 100, 100 nanoseconds. And the sockets are 28 cores, or 56 CPUs, all right? So within that 100 nanosecond radius, if you will, we can reach 55 other CPUs. Let's go back in time nine years before that. This, thing was, this machine was new in 2017. And this is another machine I was using earlier. And uh, if you look for off socket, the worst case was just about 100 nanoseconds, but with less than a third of the CPUs. So in nine years, we've got roughly the same latency extended to more than three times the number of CPUs. And that's, that's significant. I mean, yeah, sure, it's not 2x every 18 months, like guys like I got used to in the 80s or 90s, but that's, you know, that's moving along. Hardware accelerators have promise, um, in theory, you know, um, in fact, H.C. Kung suggested a systolic array back in the 70s, where you kind of shove matrices at this thing and the product comes out the other side. Uh, but, and so if you do that, of course, it's unidirectional, so you don't have this over and back thing that whacks your, your uh, latencies in half, or whacks your, your speed in half, excuse me. Except that if I, when I look at real accelerators, they look more like that. Uh, they've got maybe some local memory, maybe they access to system memory, but it's still, they're executing instructions, the stuff's going to and from memory, and it's still request response. So who knows? So why bother? Well, you know, uh, they can optimize data transfers. Uh, there's some hardware co computation that FPGAs can do quite nicely. Uh, you get better performance for WAD, assuming you're doing something that it likes to do, and also better performance for unit cost. Again, assuming you're doing something that the accelerator likes to do. So hardware's been helping all along. Problem is, the hardware is up against hard problems. Laws of physics, electronics, mathematics, chemistry. Uh, and they're doing some work, but, you know, a reasonable question is, what are they doing about this? And one thing is memory hierarchies, again, which was mentioned earlier. So we're going to look at the cache here. Um, we're going to leave out the store buffer right, for right now. We're going to show what happens here. So let's say we've got CPU 0 and 3. And uh, CPU 0 wants to read x, then y, then for whatever reason, x again. Uh, but the cache line that it, those things are in is over on CPU 3. Well, OK, that first read is going to take a while, because we have to go over there, bring the values back, and then we finally get x. But now we've got the cache line here, so we get i really quick, write really quickly, and x again really quickly as well. OK? So given spatial and temporal lo locality, we can beat the laws of physics, or at least work around them find loopholes in them. All right. Um, and, um, you know, uh, this laptop has, you know, 16 meg of L3 cache. Uh, there's a uh, particular machine I happen to pick on in the fleet that has 40 meg. And I've seen specs up in the hundreds of megabytes for L3 cache. So uh, when it comes to lots of figs, the hardware guy, designers, to their credit, are quite happy to throw transistors at the problem, lots of transistors. All right, what about writes? This is just a summary thing. We, this time we're introducing the store buffer. So we have the CPU, the cache, and the store buffer. And what we're going to do here, CPU 0 is going to write 1 to x. x's cache line is over there on CPU 3. And CPU 3 is going to read it. We're going to have CPU 0 do its write first. So it writes. Well, it's not got the cache line. But it puts the value in the store buffer. And it requests the cache line. While that cache line is going over there, the other CPU, CPU 3, does a read. Now, that read happened after the write. If you took a stopwatch, a really fast stopwatch, and you started when the write did, and you clicked it again when the, when the read happened. Where's your stopwatch? On the left or the right? I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, was the stopwatch on the left or the right-hand side? Um, so that read definitely happened after the write, except it got the old value. It got zero. Because the request and the value hadn't propagated. Now it gets it back, so that equals zero. It's got the cache line, so it moves it to the cache line. And so what's happened, though, the, the trade-off is that CPU zero, once it started the write and was in the store buffer, was able to continue executing. It wasn't stalled waiting for the write to complete. The write took quite some time, but it didn't have to wait for it because of the store buffer. So uh, the hardware guys are also um, willing to throw what we call misordering or memory models at us. And this is why. Because what happened here is, yeah, that write happened first, the read happened later, but it, the read happened before the value written had a chance to propagate across the machine. 
all right? And uh, because of that, uh, now what you could do is you say, we don't want that, and you can make it so that it just kind of stops for a while and slows things down, but that's not what people want either. Okay, um, software can help as well. There's a lot of concurrent software already out there, so you can just make use of that. Uh, that way we can have a few people beat themselves up on the coding and tuning. Of course, the Linux kernel's concurrent is very large, so we need a lot of people, as has been noted before. Uh, the other thing is using proper APIs. Hacking your way into this stuff is not a really good thing. Okay, so modern hardware is highly optimized. It goes very fast uh, most of the time, sometimes not so much. We have incremental improvement due to integration. Um, the speed of light is still too low, slow. Atoms are still too big. Uh, making use of what's out there already is a great time-saving option that we have now that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago, which is good. And uh, the big thing is understand what the physics are doing to you and structure your code to work with the laws of physics instead of against them. And you'll have a lot less micro-optimization you need to do. Okay, uh, there's a bunch of places to get more information. Uh, some people feel a need to recover after concurrent programming, and uh, my wife came to the rescue here. Uh, so this is my wife's, uh, I haven't actually tried it myself, I don't drink, but all the neighbors really appreciate it. But the general idea is you take two liters of uh, wild Himalayan blackberries. Uh, I haven't actually seen, uh, they grow wild where I am, so there you are. I, you, I'm sure you can substitute some other fruit if you want. You put it in a four liter pot. You add uh, uh, five eighths of a liter of sugar, uh, fill the rest of the pot with vodka, uh, shake it every day for five days, preferably covering it first, just, just a hint. Okay. Um, and then once that's done, you shake it once a week for five weeks, and then you run it through a sieve, you end up with these kind of berry mush on the top. Uh, some people like to put the ice cream, and uh, people have all sorts of ways of disposing of liquid that comes out the bottom of the sieve. Now, this is, this is metric, and people offended by that, uh, here it is in, in English units. So, yeah. <laughs> With that, if we have time, questions? Oh, yeah, that, that's, use the right tool for the job. I mean, if you... Remember nothing else from this presentation, remember that. Um, and you know, if you're gonna say there isn't a right tool, well, I don't care, invent it. You know, don't let that be, any, I'm not accepting that excuse, all right? Ooh, I'm impressed. Willie. Uh, how, how long does that cocktail last you for? Me? Yeah. Forever, I don't drink. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how long does it last your wife? <laughs> uh, she doesn't drink either. <laughs> Uh, some neighbors go through it more rapidly than others, though, to your point. <laughs> okay, uh, if there are no more questions, thank you very much for your time and attention. And, uh, sure.